Billions of people around the world are experiencing signs and symptoms that relate to one specific issue in the brain. And that issue is brain inflammation or neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation is now recognized to contribute to such states as depression, Alzheimer's, as well as just generally memory issues, trouble focusing, and so many more issues. Now, neuroinflammation, again, the same thing as brain inflammation, can have a number of different drivers, and there's lots of nuance to it. But some of the most important contributors to brain inflammation are hidden things in our environment that when we target and decrease can substantially improve our brain health. I'm Dr. Austin Perlmutter. In this video, we'll be covering four of the most common hidden drivers of brain inflammation, and we'll talk about why that matters and what to do about it. If you're new here, I'm Dr. Austin Perlmutter. I have been researching and talking about brain health for many years. And on this channel, I create all sorts of content designed to give you the tips and tools you need to improve your brain health. Now, quick disclaimer, this should not be construed as medical advice and you should always consult with your healthcare practitioner before putting anything that I say into practice or really any medical advice you get on the internet into practice. With that said, if you are interested in improving your brain health, I highly recommend you subscribe to my channel. I'll be putting out all sorts of content on this subject. So let's jump into the topic of the day for hidden sources of brain inflammation, why it matters for our health and what to do about it. You've likely heard about inflammation as it relates to being a health risk. Specifically, chronic inflammation in our bodies is now recognized to drive risk for cardiovascular disease, certain types of cancers, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and basically the majority of chronic diseases in our bodies. But when inflammation comes up in the brain, this can contribute to how we think, how we act, and how we feel. In fact, the most common brain disorders and dis uh, diseases of the modern day have now been studied to have correlations with brain inflammation. And that's everything from PTSD to depression to anxiety to dementia, as well as a host of other brain-related issues. So targeting and decreasing our risk for brain inflammation is a very important part of how we should be approaching neuroscience and brain health. The first hidden risk factor for brain inflammation is something that is all around us. It is something that very few people appreciate to the extent that it is actually decreasing their health, decreasing their cognitive ability, and increasing their risk for conditions like depression. So what is it? It is air quality. Specifically, air pollution has been isolated as a major risk factor in worse brain health. Research published in journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association have shown that increased exposure to air pollutants, specifically PM 2.5s, small particle air pollutants, uh, is linked to higher risk for dementia, specifically Alzheimer's dementia, as well as depression. Why is this the case? Well, the principal reason that is being discussed is that air pollution increases the inflammatory changes in the brain. The reason this may happen is that it appears that air pollution can actually activate the brain's immune cells called microglial cells. And when microglial cells become activated, they can increase inflammation in the brain. So they can actually expand the effects of inflammation within the brain. Now, air pollution can come from a host of different sources, but I'm going to give you a list of some of the most common air pollutants that are hidden in our local environments. The reason that these are so important is because the majority of our day is spent indoors. 90 plus percent of our day is indoors, breathing in indoor air. So while wild, uh, wildfires or uh, environmental pollutants outside of our homes matter a lot, for most people in the United States in particular, the majority of the air pollution you'll be exposed to is happening inside your home. Some of the major contributors would be things like air fresheners. So that would include sprays, air diffusers, as well as those little dangly uh, pine trees you put into your rearview mirror. These are sources of air pollutants, including PM 2.5s, especially VOCs, volatile organic compounds, as well as unventilated stovetops. Now, there is a lot of conversation around gas stoves, whether they are or are not harmful to our health. But the consensus here is if you are producing smoke or other other air pollution in a kitchen, that is something to worry about. What you should do is not ditch your stove or stop cooking at home, but rather make sure you are ventilating your stovetop. So if you have a ventilation system, use that. And if you don't have one, 
open a window, consider putting an air purifier in your kitchen. Other things to consider, scented candles, incense. I hate to say it, but incense is actually a concentrated source of air pollution. It's doing our brains no service. And then a number of other kind of industrial chemicals that we bring into our homes. So if you're bringing paint into your home, if you're even bringing new furniture in your home, these are things that can off gas. So things to consider, again, is to limit your use of air fresheners, to open your windows and ventilate your rooms in general, to use the hoods or the vents on your stovetop, and don't bring these smelly chemicals into your home. When I say smelly, I'm talking about things like paint and gasoline. Keep those outside of your home so you're not inhaling those and unnecessarily damaging your brain by producing things like brain inflammation in your home. So again, number one is air pollution. It is a major hidden source of brain inflammation. Number two is going to be to decrease your exposure to unnecessarily stressful media. Now, this is, again, a contentious subject because we talk so much about being informed, and I do think it's important to be informed. But when we look at what we're actually doing most of the time when we're engaging with the media, whether that's social media, watching the news on TV, listening to the radio, reading a newspaper, whatever it might be, we are by and large consuming content that is making us upset. And it is well established that over the last several decades, there has been a progression towards negativity in the news that we consume. The reason being that our brains have a negativity bias and they hyper-focus on things that are stressful. That is an issue because stress, specifically chronic stress, is a well-known contributor to inflammation, and this may especially be a risk for brain inflammation. So what do you do about this? Don't stop listening to the news completely unless you really want to, but be careful and limit your exposure. If you are getting enriching content that is changing the way that you understand the world, changing your actions for the better, phenomenal. But if you're watching the same news stations for hours and they're just repeating the same sensationalized and stressful content day in and day out, realize that that is a risk for brain inflammation and consider turning it off at that point. The third thing, which is a hidden risk factor for brain inflammation, is something that is all around us. It is so pervasive. And in fact, it's actually the absence of doing something that is so problematic. So what is it? It is sedentary behavior. We all know exercise is something that is good for us. It turns out not moving our bodies is bad for us. And what's super interesting about this, this gets to the concept of metabolic health relating to brain health, is that when we move our muscles, when we exercise our bodies, we can actually improve the state of our immune system throughout our bodies, and it seems to have a benefit in our brains. The reasons why this seems to be the case includes molecules like myokines. These are tiny molecules produced by exercising muscles that are believed to have an impact on brain immunity, but there's also benefit just to regulating our overall metabolic state. If we bring down our needs for insulin, if we bring down our blood circulating glucose, as well as help to regulate our blood glucose, these are things that are linked to better inflammatory state, meaning less chronic inflammation in our bodies. And this may translate into better immune state, meaning less chronic inflammation in the brain. So what do you do about this? Well, it's pretty simple. Just move your body, find a way to do it. And it doesn't mean you have to run a 5K. It certainly doesn't mean you have to go deadlift 400 pounds. Just start doing some movement. Now, if you want to take this one step further, I am a big fan of compound exercises that involve especially lower body muscles. These tend to be the largest muscles in the body. So if you're interested in doing weight training and you haven't done it before, maybe something to consider. Consider talking to a trainer, somebody who can help you with this. But the point here is to say, that lifting weights in addition to aerobic exercise are both wonderful ways to prioritize your brain health, and in part, this may work by decreasing brain inflammation. The last hidden risk factor for neuroinflammation or brain inflammation is something that is being increasingly recognized for other reasons, but something that we should all be talking about as it relates to, again, this mechanism of improving brain health through potentially decreasing risk for neuroinflammation. And what it is, is traumatic brain injuries. These are TBIs. They are so common. Uh, they can happen for a number of reasons. Um, but the key takeaway here is that TBI is linked to higher risk for a host of brain-related issues, mood issues, Alzheimer's disease, issues with focus, issues with attention, 
And a core mechanism appears to be because traumatic brain injuries may increase brain inflammation. How does this happen? Well, when we look at research here, it seems that uh, TBI activates these microglial cells as well as other types of glial cells within our brain, and it may damage the blood-brain barrier. So how are we experiencing TBI? Well, top causes include falls, motor vehicle accidents, and sports injuries. There is a lot that can be said about the sports, contact sports, and whether that is a good or bad thing for brain health. I would say it is overall a bad thing for brain health, but what we're talking about here is trying to prevent. So what can you do that prevents that is low kind of uh, disruption in your life? Certainly wear a seatbelt, wear a helmet if you're on a bicycle, a motorcycle, or in any sort of motor vehicle, and considering for the elderly especially, the prevention of falls. A lot to be said about what you should do in your home and your environment to help prevent falls. But if you are an elderly person and you are feeling like your balance is decreasing, this is an amazing opportunity to talk to your healthcare practitioner. Geriatricians are especially excellent at this. Certain medications can increase fall risk and there's a lot that you can do around your home as well as with other things. It could be as simple as getting a new pair of glasses to decrease risk of falls, which decreases risk of TBI, which can help decrease risk for brain inflammation. So these are the four things that are hidden. They're all around us, but they can make a big difference if we take this science into account and start making simple changes to our lives. Now, if you've enjoyed this content, again, I'm Dr. Austin Perlmutter. I put out a ton of brain-focused content, tools, tips, things to help you live your best life by optimizing your brain function. Consider subscribing here, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.